The presenter today will be Greg Vernon, the Director of Product Development at Coreform. We'll be talking about the fundamentals of hex meshing, learning to use web cutting, imprinting, and merging. So if you're new to Coreform Qubit, Coreform Qubit is used across industries for mesh preparation and uh, simulation across a variety of solvers. It has a number of CAD importing cleanup tools, semi-automated hex meshing, lots of controls to control mesh quality and, and properties, and also Python and scripting. The learning objectives of today's webinar is to improve your understanding of hex meshing, help you learn more about Coreform Qubit's unique methodologies for mesh building, and then we'll teach you the three most valuable commands for hex meshing in Coreform Qubit, which are web cutting, imprinting, and merging. As a background, if, if you're curious why hex meshing is so difficult, you can watch our previous webinar um, where we talked about this, and there's a lot of other previous webinars you can watch on our website. And while we're talking about uh, webinars, our next webinar that we'll be doing, we'll be talking about strategies for solving tricky meshing problems. So if, if you have participated on the core forum online forum, it's a place to get a lot of your Qubit questions answered. And what we thought we would do is just give our audience a chance to have a live Q&A session. So any questions that you may have of tricky situations, we'll go ahead and answer as many of them as we can live in our next webinar on September 24th. You can submit your question on the form and then like other questions that you want to recommend to prioritize for featuring in that future webinar. But as far as today, in our, our webinar, our host Greg Vernon will demonstrate how to use the three most important hex meshing commands in Qubit, web cutting, imprinting, and merging. We'll do it on a minimal working example, a single part, and then an assembly. He'll share some expert tips and trip, tricks along the way. And then of course, throughout the webinar, we'll be answering questions live in the, the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. Um, so before I turn it over to Greg, I wanna just go ahead and, and run a poll so Greg can have a little bit of a sense of who's attending today. Okay, so it looks like the today the, the main reason people are attending is to improve competence with the Qubit user interface and terminology, as well as uh, improving understanding of text meshing and Qubit's unique methodologies for mesh building. So I think it aligns well with what you have prepared to share, Greg. Um, so with that, I'll turn the time over to Greg Vernon. Greg, again, is the Director of Product Management at Coreform. He's used Qubit professionally for eight years to solve difficult problems and prepare them for simulations. So um, he's, you're in good hands. I'll turn the time over to Greg. Thanks, Matt, for the introduction. Um, and thanks everyone for attending today. Um, I hope that you learn a lot uh, today. And I think that, I think that you will. Um, so I guess I'd like to start off, since there were quite a few um, people who said that they wanted to learn a little bit more about hex meshing just in general, I'll briefly introduce what the challenge is with hex meshing um, and maybe versus tetrahedral meshing. So this is a, a simple geometry um, that we see here. And the, the challenge with hex meshing versus tet meshing is that in tet meshing, it is sufficient to build a triangle mesh on a, um, around a volume so if I cut this, you'll see that there are, there are no tetrahedra, it is just triangles. From a given triangle mesh, you can automatically, you can just do a command here to say uh, tet mesh try all. There are algorithms that can take any given triangular mesh as long as it's valid and build a tetrahedral mesh. So if I now do this web cut, you'll see that there are now tetrahedra on the inside. And so they'll call this a bounding triangulation that they can build, that we can build a tet mesh from. Now with, uh, with hex meshing, if we were to do the same approach of starting with, in, for a hex mesh, a quadrilateral mesh. So let me do, um, this real quick. If I start with a quadrilateral mesh, and again, I've got no hexahedra, it is not known how to build hexahedral meshes from this bounding quadrangulation. 
Um, and it's actually, an, it's actually an open problem in mathematics. So what we need to do as the user is we need to help the computer understand how to lay down hexahedra. And that's the challenge with hex meshing. And there's a lot of really good advancements going on in hex meshing. Um, people looking at artificial intelligence and machine learning to try to augment the process, as well as improved uh, user interface tools. So since I said that, I want to just now introduce the ways in Qubit that we can create this, um, create a mesh are by decomposing a complex volume here. So you'll see if I actually try to mesh this volume, Qubit will tell me that it has failed to mesh this volume. So Qubit was unable to see how to lay out a mesh automatically on this volume. So what we need to do as a user is decompose it into simpler volumes that Qubit's meshing algorithms are able to understand uh, how to lay out a hex mesh. So I'm just gonna show, there are essentially three main commands that we're going to do. The first is web cut, which is what we call partitioning. And I wanna make very clear that the web cut icon is a pair of scissors. And so it does exactly what you would expect if I took a pair of scissors and cut along geometry, it separates volumes and completely disconnects them. So I wanna show this. I'm going to do a web cut um, of this volume. I'm gonna extend this surface. So you can see this little blue uh, web that I've previewed here is going to cut this volume. And so now I've got a green volume and a yellow volume. And I'm also gonna cut going to cut this volume by that same surface. Now I have three volumes, two squares, a cylinder and another square. And now notice, one of, if, if I choose to say move this uh, yellow volume uh, upwards, say in the Y direction, it is able to move independently of the other volumes. So just as if I'd taken a pair of scissors and cut along those surfaces, these are now completely disconnected and they have no information about their neighboring volumes. And so I could do, I can now build a mesh. Qubit knows how to mesh a cube and a cylinder. But notice how, since these are clearly disconnected, these meshes are also disconnected. There's no information about this cylinder on either of these two cubes. And if I were to move the cylinder back down, it's obviously still disconnected in the mesh. We would call this a non-conforming hex mesh. Some, some uh, finite element codes will allow you to take two non-conforming uh, meshes and apply tie constraints between them to um, approximate them as being connected. And that can sometimes be a good strategy for when you have really complex components that you just can't build a conforming mesh on, you can oftentimes build meshes on the individual components and then tie them together in your finite element code. In this case, we it should hopefully be fairly clear that we could build a conforming mesh if we wanted to. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to delete this mesh. Now, the way that we'll build a conforming mesh is it will first do what we call imprint. So I'm gonna use this icon here. So just to show the navigation of the command panel, I'm in mode, volume, and then imprint and merge. And I'm gonna going to first just do an imprint between the green volume and this yellow volume. And what that does is it imprints the topology from the yellow volume onto the green volume. So if I just draw this green volume, you'll see that now there is a circular shape on this, on this volume. So I've imprinted that topology of the cylinder's face onto the face of this square. And if I were to mesh this square, we'll kind of see that we've kind of captured that shape of the, of the uh, cylinder on this square. Um, but if I, the, the key with imprint is that we haven't actually connected the geometries. We've just told the neighboring volumes that there is some topology that I want you to have. 
So if I draw the cylinder, you'll see that its surface is not yet meshed. And that's because these are still two distinct volumes. So I'll show that again, that I can take this yellow volume and I can move it again in the Y direction. And I could still mesh all these volumes. So it's still not a conforming mesh. The meshes happen to maybe have a similar shape that they're meshing, but they are, they are different. I could even choose to mesh this volume at a much finer density. So let's do maybe density of point, um, point oh 0.05. So clearly this density of this mesh here is tighter than, or is more fine than the mesh on the green volume. And so if I were to move this yellow volume back down, it's clearly still not a conforming mesh. And that brings us to the last part of these important tools for building conforming meshes. Um, delete this mesh real quick. Also, you'll notice if I turn on transparency, I hope this comes through, um, through Zoom, but hopefully you see a little bit of kind of uh, striping between uh, in the middle of my screen here. It's kind of like a green and a yellow. And what that's showing us is that there are two surfaces that are unique, but co-located. And if we have that, what we can do then is then merge those essentially duplicate surfaces together so I'm going to merge volumes one and two. That um, striation kind of goes away. I can also draw surface with a property called is meshed. Sorry, not is, is merged. And I can see then this merged surface. Now I've only merged one of those two volumes. That's why I only have a single cylinder. And just I can to now uh, display here, just to get us back. So that's the surface that here that um, that is merged. Now, if I were to try to move this yellow volume, say two in the positive y direction again, it moves together. These are now merged. Their topology is shared. And if I mesh the green volume, we'll see that it's it's capturing the mesh density that I wanted for this yellow. If I draw the yellow volume, because they're sharing the exact same surface and I've meshed the, the hex, this surface is already meshed. And now if I mesh this cylinder, it continues on. And so just to show now, this is now a conforming mesh on um, on these two volumes. And of course, if I move this, these volumes back down, I could imprint and merge in a single step through this imprint merge between all three of these volumes. And then I can build this one uh, conforming mesh. And so notice that even though I didn't do a lot, I mean, I did one web cut and then imprint and merge, that was enough for Qubit to recognize how to build a hex mesh on this volume. And so you'll hear people say automatic hex meshing. And in the industry, this is actually what's considered automatic hex meshing. What, what's meant by that is that if you have shapes that can be recognized as hex meshable, that then the, the computer will then automatically hex mesh them. That's different than fully automatic hex meshing, which is essentially no user interaction required. So I wanna show a few more examples on web cutting and merging, or sorry, web cut, imprint, and merge. Here's another shape that is two cylindrical bodies um, that intersect each other. Now, something that's important is that if you imagine the physical problem, we've kind of got this ill-defined in that we're saying that there is a, um, there is a uh, two volumes that 
are they, help, they take up the same space. So there's actually two materials, right? If, if the green volume was steel and the yellow is aluminum, in our code, we'd be saying that there's both aluminum and steel at the exact same location. And that's not physical. But I want to show that an interesting thing with imprinting is that sometimes, even though there's no topology on this, where this yellow and green intersect, we can actually do an imprint between these two volumes. And it will actually capture um, that topology on the surface. So that's another case where imprinting will work. However, what we might want to do in this actual case, if I uh, let me just reload this model, is we want, might want to remove the volume that um, is overlapped. And so what you might what you want to choose in this case is is that is at the middle is it supposed to be the green volume or the yellow volume? And in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose that I want it to be the green volume material in the center. There is a Boolean operation to remove overlaps. So I can just select these two volumes. So let's select volume one, volume two, and I want to modify the yellow volume. And so that will now remove the interior of that. And I could then do my um, imprint uh, and merge if I wanted to. Now, this is still not meshable automatically. Uh, Cuba is recognizing how to mesh these two cylinders, but it doesn't know how to mesh this, this uh, green cylinder. And this is inspired by a question we had in our forum recently. So in this case, what we need to do is we need to think, how do I decompose this so that Qubit can recognize how to apply one of its hex meshing schemes? And if we look at its schemes, Qubit can build mapped and submapped meshes, uh, which are essentially structured meshes or substructured meshes. It can also do a sweep, which is what we see here, where there's a single surface is meshed and it sweeps along a direction. And then it has a built-in method for meshing a sphere. And then another method that's called polyhedron, which is oftentimes a little confusing what that does. And so I'd like to, this is a good example to show what polyhedron mesh can mesh. But this is oftentimes a, um, a good little meshing tool. So what we're gonna do here is we can kind of see how, and again, from that original yellow geometry, that I could have the cylinder extend all the way throughout this volume. Um, so let me delete my mesh here. I could have it extend all the way throughout. I'm gonna extend, I'm gonna use a web cut that's called sheet extended from surface. I'm gonna cut the green volume by extending the surface on this blue cylinder. And I can preview all web cuts to see what's going to happen. So you can see here, this is the web that it's making that's going to perform the cut. So that's the web cut. Now I've got an interior volume that, um, again, I can still have it be the value. I can assign it the, the property values of, of steel, which was the original green volume. Um, but the key is there's only a single volume at that location. And then I'm going to apply another cut on the coordinate plane. I'm gonna cut all volumes um, in this direction and then in this direction, as well as along their center lines. Now, um, there's another web cut. If this volume, this volume happens to be centered at the origin, but say it wasn't, we also have an, another useful tool called plane from curve where I can choose my volumes to cut. I can choose a curve and I want to evaluate that curve at some location. So maybe a fraction of 0.2 along its curve, it'll compute the tangent. So 0.2, so this is the ratio of 0.2 along this curve, it computes the tangent. And this might be the web you would use. Or of course, in this case, I might want the midpoint. So if this was off centered somewhere off in space, maybe it wasn't aligned with my origin, this might be another way it could effectively do this same cut. And now, um, what I like to do before I try imprinting and merging, if I want a merged mesh, is I will first see if the volumes can mesh independently. Because once we imprint and merge, you make the hex meshing problem more challenging because you have to share element sizes across boundaries. 
So I'm just going to see if Cubic can automatically mesh everything by just saying mesh vol all. As you can see, it was able to still mesh the cylinders, but it still struggled on these two volumes. Another way that you could, this mesh volume all, is it in the mesh meshing scheme, if you automatically calculate, it will try to find the automatic schemes as well. Now these two, these volumes here, um, I can mesh with the poly, I should be able to mesh with polyhedron scheme. And so this is a case where Qubit wasn't even, Qubit wasn't able to determine automatically that it could build a polyhedron mesh, but I kind of knew that it could, um, or I thought that it might be able to, because it looked familiar. And so I want to just show what this volume kind of looks like. Um, the polyhedron scheme, you can kind of see by these layouts, it is kind of a semi-structured mesh. It's just regions of structured meshes that are joined together. But typically when volumes that look like this, or if you imagine a, a cube where one of the corners, you've taken a spherical shape out of it, um, polyhedron mesh tends to work well with that. I'll show what that kind of volume looks like um, that polyhedron works well with. But this is just to show that we can build this, poly this polyhedron mesh here. We draw everything over again. And I then assume that I can go ahead and I'm actually going to right click and say select similar volumes. And Cube is able to detect those similar volumes and assign all of them to polyhedron mesh. Now, this is still non conforming because I haven't imprinted and merged. But again, if I needed to do a tie contact, I might do that. So now I verify that my entire volume uh, meshes um, without imprinting and merging. And now I'm ready to take that last step of actually applying the imprint and merge. So I'm going to go, in this case, because of all the webkits I've done, I should be able to, to just merge. But I'm going to go ahead and, in case it, there's a few imprints that still need to be done, I'm going to, going to allow it to imprint as well. Oops. Uh, X-ray selection on. Here we go. And now I'm going to try to mesh fall all. And Qubit probably needs to have this done in a certain order. So let's do delete mesh. If I try meshing these volumes first, so select similar volumes and mesh these polyhedron. Let me uh, turn this visibility off. So what you can see here is that I've built that initial polyhedron mesh and that's allowed Qubit now, it's built this structured mesh here that it can do a sweep on. So if I draw these volumes, right, these are now, you can see how these should be sweepable because I could define a paved scheme here and then sweep along this structured direction. So what I should be able to do now is mesh the remaining volumes. And so this is another strategy is that when you look at this volume, these cylinders that cut through, these are not really that difficult to mesh. They're not constrained very much. But these polyhedron element, uh, volumes, they have to have a lot of constraints in order for them to be able to build this complex polyhedron scheme and conform with their neighbors, which is why we mesh them first. A general hex meshing strategy is to mesh constrained volumes first and then um, mesh the less constrained volumes later. So if you notice that after an imprint and merge, it typically means that you just need to mesh or tell Qubit the order with which to mesh volumes. So now this is again another um, conforming hexahedral mesh that we built through imprint and merge. So Greg, here's a question from David. Does the polyhedron mesher always create hexahedral elements? Yes, this is a this is a hexahedral element. The scheme is called polyhedron. So the scheme being what kind it's such a kind of saying, what kind of geometry am I looking for? And there's documentation on um, all these meshing schemes. If you go to the go to the help meshing operations, um, there's documentation for this polyhedron that what it's it's of how it's looking for the kinds of shapes um, 
So these are these are all hexahedral elements, but they're essentially decomposing the CAD geometry as if it was polyhedron. That might so it's kind of mappable to like a convex um, polyhedral shape. Uh, but that, that's a very good question. It is not. It is not a poly. It does not build polyhedral elements. It decomposes the volume as though it was a polyhedra, and then fills it with hexahedral elements. Great, thank you. Yep, good question. I want to show something else now. Um, so, especially new users to Qubit, there's a lot of web cuts, and um, to be honest, sometimes you have to just try all of the web cuts to see how they work. Um, like a loop, you might wonder like what does loop web cut do and you might it might suggest that maybe i can loop with maybe some curve ids and hey you know that seems to have trimmed this volume along a curve loop but otherwise the strategy I may mean, it takes it does take practice to get good at hex meshing and what we have in qubit is a command panel or a tab called item i-t-e-m if you don't see this tab under your uh, your view, there's a little wizard hat and item here that if you toggle that this button, it'll show the item tab and remove it. And what item does is it has these buttons along the side that correspond with these, this tasks button is this first one. It kind of tells you the process with which to build your mesh. So you might import, you know, import your geometry, uh, maybe from a CAD model or build it yourself. Um, and then you might, you know, try to preview like a mesh size, maybe for like a given element budget that you're shooting for. Um, but then there's prepare geometry and we could heal some of these things, but there's this build meshable topology. And that's what we're doing with web cuts. This is a neat little tool where I can click check meshability. And it tells me in two columns, whether something is meshable or not meshable. So here it's telling me that volume one is not meshable. Now, something first, real quick. Another way that people will use web cuts is that say I'm doing a finite element simulation and maybe my finite element simulation is I'm going to hold the outside of this box and I'm maybe gonna push down on this cylinder. And so it's gonna have quarter or 90 degree symmetry. So web cuts can also be used to cut this geometry down for like a simpler problem. So here I'm just going to cut this geometry first, um, again, cutting it in half, and then in half again on this curve. And I'm going to then delete these volumes. So now I've got a simplified volume that I could do quarter symmetry on. That's another case where people will use web cuts not just for hex meshing. Let's go back to item real quick. So it's telling me that this volume is not meshable. And then I've got these options to try to make it meshable. And I'm gonna go to decompose volume. And if I select the volume I want to try to make meshable, it'll give me possible solutions with the qubit commands. And you can, it'll preview all of them. And you can kind of, this is kind of useful to walk through just each of these. And you can just use your arrow buttons to cycle through them to see what all these different web cuts that Qubit thinks that it could possibly do. Now you'll see here, there is a long list of possible web cuts that Qubit has kind of automatically detected that it might be able to do. And it's kind of useful to just walk through each of these, especially when you're getting started and try to understand here's a web cut why is it doing that? Well, there is some geometric, there's some, right, there's a surface here. And, it, and to think through, okay, I can see why this web cut might be useful. So we'll select this web cut and hit execute. And then if you look at the command, we're doing a sweep surface is the web cut type. And so then that helps you learn, that will help you learn what this sweep surface option here in the command panel did. And that's just another example of, of how you can use Qubit to help yourself learn to hex mesh. And so we could just continue to go through item. You'll see now that I've got a meshable volume. Um, 
which is this highlighted volume here. And so if I click mesh, you'll see that Qubit was able to mesh this. And that's just another um, example of, of uh, how that works. Um, so uh, we can just continue on just a couple more steps here. Um, so now maybe we want to do this. Um, well, this web cut doesn't necessarily help us, but I want to show if we do this web cut on this yellow volume. Um, right, we can even keep on cutting this volume up more. Um, And uh, you might have noticed that uh, you might have noticed the maybe the hex mesh didn't look it kind of looked a bit skewed when I did that. If I do this web cut here, oops, that's not the web cut I wanted. Undo. Um, Let's decompose this volume. Hoping that Cuba would let me select. Let's see if I do both together. A web cut of this planar surface. And Cuba may not have been able to recognize that, but it, I wanted to show that. So if I just do a plane surface here on these two volumes. More than just being able to build a mesh, you can also use these web cuts, even though it's already meshable. If I now mesh these volumes, the meshes will be a little bit more well behaved. Actually, let me imprint these first. Um, so imprint and merge. Um, well, the point is, is that because I've defined a hard boundary, these elements will be more well aligned. They won't grow quite like as skewed. And so that's just uh, um, something that's useful um, for, for more web cutting. So anyways, that's just a tool that I find a lot of new users to Qubit find useful just to understand the different kinds of web cuts they can do and why uh, you might do a web cut to build a hex mesh. Because uh, hex meshing is an art. Here's the question that came in. How much flexibility does the hex mesh allow regarding modifying the standard mesh size. Yeah, so there's a fair bit of options for the mesh size. Um, under our meshing panel, you can either, so th there's an icon here with it kind of is, looks like a CAD drawing with dimensions on it. And you can choose various different tools to build a, to build a mesh or to, to choose a sizing. So we could say choose to mesh this purple volume with a, a finer mesh, so maybe like 0 0.05, um, like maybe 0 0.025, I might have just got the same number. There we go. Now, the, the thing with hexes is that unlike tetrahedra though, they do have inherently more structure or need more structure. And so whereas a tetrahedral mesh, you could have a very fine mesh here and then grow very coarse in this mesh because they're fully unstructured. We do need to have, right, we will need, you can see here I've got a high aspect ratio because it needs to still capture the structuredness of that surface that we'd swept through. So that is one limitation with hex meshes is that you don't have quite the same level of adaptivity in terms of mesh size as you do with tetrahedra. But what you gain with hex meshes typically in FEA is higher accuracy per degree of freedom. So they're typically more efficient um, and uh, uh, they oftentimes are more well behaved in terms of numerically. And so if you're trying to get tough nonlinear problems to converge, um, there's a whole bunch of linear algebra around condition numbers and other things that make hexahedral elements oftentimes a, a better choice than tetrahedral elements. But that's not to say that tetrahedral elements should never be used. And in fact, I want to show now um, this last model here of an assembly. I want to show a tip here um, that I like to do when I'm modeling with complex assemblies 
is that I've got all of these volumes, but these are really kind of individual parts. And so I like to write myself a little qubit Python script. Um, and we should honestly, um, Carl, as I, as I think about this, we should honestly add this to qubit. Um, so what I'm going to do, going to do here is take each volume of my initial model and add them to a group. So part one, part two, and so on. As I do web cuts, these groups will retain all of their children's geometries. And that will allow me to kind of e more easily identify parts to cut. So let me draw, um, let me draw this, this volume here, because this, this is the challenging volume I want to show. Um, do one more thing here. Um, so on this volume, what makes this volume challenging to mesh are these fillets, that they essentially come in and are tangent with this cylinder. And if, if I were to do a web cut along this cylinder, I would get very poor element shapes. And on this side, right, they even come up to the top of the cylinder. So what I think about when I see this is I'm telling my, I kind of break this down mentally. I've broken, I've already broken this down into three regions. I'm going to break it down into this, this circular region and this circular region, and then a middle region that I can build a hex mesh on. So what I'm going to do is take this volume, um, and I'm going to sweep a surface. So I selected this top surface here in the perpendicular direction to the surface. So this is a planar surface, I can do this. So we'll do this cut. So you can see I've now broken it down into four volumes. Um, but essentially these two, I'm gonna be able to hex mesh. And then these two, I'm gonna build a tet mesh on. But I want this to be a conforming mesh. Um, so again, I can just show that if I do this separately, I can mesh, you know, I have a really coarse mesh size here that I'll fine up, I'll refine, but just to show that I can mesh each, these two volumes, I know I can build a hex mesh on independently, but now I want to be able to build a tet mesh on these, on these volumes here and build it conforming. So let's delete the mesh here. I'm going to imprint and merge. Um, and I can say volumes in part two, since part two is this group that I have, it contains these volumes. And um, um, let me get this real quick. And so, yeah, so I'm gonna imprint and merge these volumes in part two. And then let's take a mesh size here. Um, let's do a, vol a size of say two or uh, maybe one. So let me actually use the GUI here. So volumes. Now I could choose each of these volumes and kind of do this slider to try to choose an automatic size. Um, so maybe like this is, maybe this is like the automatic size I want to use. It's gonna tell me that's about a size of 0.1. So I usually like to have nice round numbers. So delete mesh, um, vol in, actually again, do this through the command panel, um, approximate size. Volumes in part two, approximate size is one. So again, you can see I did, was able to build at least a hex mesh here. It's not yet conforming because we need to still imprint, but just want to get that mesh size figured out. Let's go back to imprint and merge. So let's imprint these volumes. And again, if we draw now this yellow volume, We'll see that imprint from its neighbor has shown up, as well as if we look at, um, well, yeah, there's nothing else that's been necessarily imprinted, but now we can merge these volumes. And again, what's what's oftentimes, oops, let's do imprint, let's do this, make sure. Um, raw surface with is merged. 
Yep. So we can just see that these are the surfaces that have been merged together, right? Which are those boundaries between the volumes. And uh, so what we're going to do now is draw part two. I know that I'm just not going to be able to build a hex mesh on these two volumes. So I'm just going to specify these to be tetrahedral meshes on these two parts. I'm going to first mesh the hex geometries. So automatically calculate. If we look at these two regions that we're going to have a tet mesh on, you can see that their surface has already a quadrilateral mesh. So now when we build a tet mesh on these volumes, it will use this quadra these quadrilaterals as the base of pyramid elements that transition between the hexes to tetrahedra. And so you can see I've now got a mostly tetrahedral mesh with a single layer of pyramids. And I'll show that a little bit clearer in, a, in just a moment. Let me do this other volume here. Um, and then block three, just for visualization. So I've colored this by the element types. And if I do a, if I web cut this through, let me, my orientation here. Let's see if we can see these yet. There we go. You'll see that we have this single layer of pyramids that transition us to tetrahedrals. So let me just draw these three elements here. So again, a single, so a hex pyramid to a tet. And this is another part of you know hex meshing is that we just oftentimes, um, we just can't afford to spend the time to build, um, build this entire mesh. And so we just need to, um, um, go with a tetrahedral mesh um, just so that we can solve our problem. And if you have solvers that support uh, tetrahedral meshes and pyramid elements, then this can be a really good strategy for trying to build um, a mostly hexahedral mesh that can still give you good computational performance. Um, but then with tetrahedrals where you just can't afford um, the time uh, to build the mesh. Um, Anyways, so that's just, I just wanted to show, we could continue on meshing this, this volume, but I know we're starting to get a little bit close on time. Um, I wanna show one last volume here that is, that's a bit challenging or can appear to be a bit challenging. Let me turn off um, this, which is this volume here. It's a little bit beyond just imprint and merge. Um, but what we can kind of see here is that maybe there's two regions. I can kind of visualize that I could mesh kind of the volume, a volume that would be associated with this feature, as well as a volume associated with maybe a sweep through this direction. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do another web cut. I'm going to sweep this surface on this volume. Again, perpendicular in the inward direction. You can see it doesn't quite line up, right? Because these surfaces aren't quite duplicates of each other. Instead of doing a surface, I could do a curve as well, but then I'd have to know the the vector that I want to rotate around. So whenever you can do a sweep by surface, that oftentimes is a preferable tool to, to do it this way. And of course I can right click and just hit mesh and Qubit knows how to mesh this geometry automatically. So now I can turn, turn my attention to this volume. Now Qubit doesn't support in its sweep meshing, which is you mesh one surface and sweep through, it supports a many to one surface. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to decide, I'm gonna mesh in the downward direction. There's a tool under geometry, surface, modify and composite that will apply virtual topology. So I can select 
these surfaces to be part of a single macro surface. So if I mesh this top volume here, if I do a finer mesh, um, I'll get better um, capturing of this, uh, of this top surface. Ooh, that was really fine. Um, We need to just do like two and then mesh the surface. So what I'm going to do now is my sweep direction is going to be um, from these many surfaces. So I'm going to go to the mesh module, volume, scheme, sweep, select this blue volume, specify source and target. And I'm going to hold down the control button on my Windows computer to select these multiple surfaces as the source, and then a one single target surface that's this macro virtual surface I created on the bottom. And then Cubic can build this mesh through a sweep. And um, so now, you know, we want this conforming geometry so I can now do a um, under volume imprint merge I can imprint and merge these two volumes together and then mesh uh, oops let's go delete mesh I need to mesh the constrained volume first so we probably need just to respecify this uh, scheme. sweep from these surfaces through to this target. Mesh that volume and then mesh this volume. So that was one extra little tool that I showed you today, which was compositing. And we'll do more webinars in the future on compositing. But what I wanted to show is that you can have a virtual geometry and still imprint and merge with its neighboring volumes. And, and so that's just another capability that imprint and merge allows you to do. Um, and so Matt, I think my headphones just killed out on me. So I'm just switching over to my other ear, earphones. I think I'm done with today, with the technical discussion. Um, Matt, could you say something so I can see if I can hear you? Yeah, yeah, great work today, Greg. Yeah, I can hear you, there we go. Good, great. Yeah. No, thank you again so much for, for sharing all of this. Um, we, yeah, now we have time for a few questions. Um, so here's a question from Alex. Could you share the Python script for moving volumes to groups? Yes, yeah, so I'll show this on the screen here. I'll also make this available. Um, we'll, we'll include this with our email um, that goes out afterwards. That something else I didn't show either but so I, I like to use this little script. And again, we'll work to add more of this functionality that's really useful into Qubit. Um, but what I'm doing here, and we have a webinar, by the way, on using Qubit Python. And I, it's on YouTube, and I would highly encourage you to, to uh, search for that, um, just on our YouTube channel. But I'm essentially getting out, I'm querying from Qubit all of the volumes as an ID, and that comes into a tuple. And then for each value in that tuple, I'm then doing string evaluation with this. So this is an F string in Python to create a group named part underscore and then that volumes ID. And then I'm adding that part. Um, so that adding this volume to that part. And what I'll then often do is I delete the mesh here is that you might have decomposed your volume now into hundreds of, of geometries, hundreds of volumes. This other little script here, Snippet, will imprint and merge um, items within a group. And so it's similar to how we could do imprint and merge volumes. I could say volumes in part two. That will only merge the volumes, you know, all volumes that are in a given, that are in a given group. Um, it's just a way to, you know, do it automatically on all of the volumes. And uh, so I just, 
I personally just kind of like to do that. And so this is the, this is typically the way that I like to do work is that I will be always writing Python scripts and journal files as I'm building my models. And then I save them with my project files. But this is just a, a nice little tool to just to iterate through. Um, and uh, so, yeah, you'll be able to see this on the recording. You could pause the video on the recording to see this, or we'll also include this in the email that we'll send out um, to you. And, and we'll also be looking to add hopefully some of this functionality um, more directly in the qubit for automation. Um, and there's other webinars we have that show you how to actually build like your own custom toolbar. And you could actually add, you could write your Python script and then add this as a custom toolbar to your session. That's also something I typically do. I've got a fresh install of qubit right now, so I don't have my custom toolbars, but that's a, that's something I, that I'll do is I'll find these useful snippet and then I'll create custom toolbars. And you should go off and see our previous webinars on that. That's great. Thank you, Craig. Maybe we could also put this on our form as well. So. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yep, that's a good point. Okay. Yeah, we'll make, a, we'll make a, a forum post on this webinar and then we'll also include these scripts there. That's great. what we'll do. So we have time for a few more questions. By the way, as you, as you leave the webinar, we have a one question exit survey um, that will help us identify what we should focus on for future webinars. And so as, as you leave, if you wouldn't mind taking that survey, we'd appreciate it. Let's see, we've got some more questions yeah. coming in. Yeah, so there's a question about being able to increase or decrease elements from lines or curves. So um, let me just show something here. Um, all. So one thing we can do is we can just define meshes on volume surfaces and curves. And so say that you knew that you wanted to have a finer resolution on a curve at some location, you could actually mesh, say a given curve based on different schemes, like maybe a curvature scheme. I mean, I don't know what a good curvature here to pick is, but let's, um, or like a, you know, a certain amount of elements along. So I get to pick like 20 elements along this curve. And so then now this mesh will then be propagated into the volumes. Um, there are also on volume schemes, there's a forum post that I encourage people to look for. Um, it's fairly recent. Um, you can even bring in like a sizing function from like an external mesh. And so if you run like a simulation, you've got like a density, or like a high stress region, you could bring that volume in and you could remesh or specify your element sizes based on that. Um, again, hexahedral meshing is more restrictive than tetrahedral meshing in terms of being able to, to vary element sizes, um, but those are your strategies to, to do that. Thanks, Craig. Yep. So and then, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, usually here's a question from Ron. Would you recommend attempting to hex mesh complex geometries such as organic shapes like bones where finer meshes are needed in particular areas such as small curves? Yeah, that's a good, that's a very good question. Um, so something we didn't talk about a lot today, but I'll at least show a quick demo of is that we can actually say, so I'm gonna bring in here, oops, let's, uh, here's an STL file. So I've, I've read an STL file of a brain stem. Um, and we can. This is a. This is not as well supported as our ACE as our uh, normal CAD kernel, but there are some develop in development capabilities that we can choose to do a web cut. So I just want to show that I could do a web cut here. Um, I'm just going to pick one arbitrarily. So I could do web cuts to try to build hexable regions if I wanted to, um, but typically what we recommend here is that we have in Qubit a technique called um, Sculpt, um, which does an overlay uh, grid approach. Um, oh, let's, let me, uh, this is probably gonna take, let's see, let's get a cell size, I don't know. So we're gonna shoot for like a half million elements or so. I'm gonna run this on eight cores, which is how many cores I have on my computer. And we've got webinars on this, uh, sculpt tool as well uh, for building hex meshes on kind of organic shapes. But um, what I'll typically say just in general is that organic shapes are the toughest geometries to build hex meshes on um, that are say of, of high quality. 
Um, and so that's an, an open area of research. And they struggle from the same issue with because we don't know that we can build a, qua a quadrangular mesh and automatically build a, a valid hex mesh on the interior, we don't really have good approaches for building um, high quality hex meshes like we do for a tet mesh on this case. This is just, if you look at this, uh, if I just uh, say draw this, this volume here, you can see that on my surface, I've maybe got some elements of dubious quality, right? I mean, they're, they're, they're valid, but you know, if you cared about surface stresses, you may not like these high aspect ratios. And this is where, you know, again, while this is a hex meshing webinar, um, it's oftentimes, I mean, it's, it's helpful and useful to have in your toolbox, the ability to build a tetrahedral mesh, say on a volume if you need to. Um, so Qubit is able to also build a tetrahedral mesh on this volume. Um, which it's going through and doing right now. Probably should have picked a mesh size that was a bit coarser so we could finish in time, but I just wanted to show that that's, that might be a better approach for some of these organic shapes in some cases. But I know that that isn't always an option. So, so yeah, so thanks for that. Thanks for that question. That's a really good question. Um, Craig, the last question that just snuck in. Can you make a washer shape around a hole and extrude through for an RBE attachment. Yeah, I think I understand what's being asked here. So RBE being a rigid body um, is my assumption. So I think I've got a model here that might have this or have an example here, bolt plate. Um, so you kind of want like a washer shape around. So um, what, I'm gonna, what I would say is that um, we do have say a web cut on, you can web cut a surface. So I could say choose to web cut the surface with like a cylinder radius that I could pull off of something from like an existing arc. Um, I thought this was gonna be um, a circle here. So I guess I could, I could always web cut. Um, let's do this, draw ball two. Let me just show this real quick. Remove surface. Let's say that we have this, this model here. I could web cut this surface, say from a cylinder radius. So this, um, this, will, this will do on the body, I suppose. Although we could do, uh, um, do this. Imprint this surface with say this surface. It's not gonna like that, is it? Oh, that's because it's on a surface. But it, anyways, point being that yes, you can do that. It's gonna. It probably takes a little bit of. Let's do like a project this curve onto the surface, and then play refresh. So if I turn off this green volume here, you can see I've got this curve on the surface, and then I can. Um, imprint this surface with this curve. And that's a way that it doesn't show up on the other side. I've just imprinted just this one surface and you could choose to have a larger, a larger curve or an offset curve and further to have your like your washer shape that, that you could then apply for RBEs. Great. So yeah. Yeah. So web cutting and printing emerging is not just relegated to volumes, but you can do that kind of all the way down on all these, you know, on surfaces and curves. So very good question. Great. Okay. Well, great. Thank you again so much for the webinar. And again, this will be recorded so everyone can watch mm -hmm. it later. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks. See ya.